Yo, ho, ho, BetUS TV. Welcome to another edition of Gen Z Sports. And might I tell you that I know that everybody in this live chat right now has been waiting for this very moment. Right off to my left or my right, depending on how your camera is mirrored, there stands a man who ran away to Disney World <laughs> after his team ended up being disappointed by the Kansas City Chiefs. And of course, also joined by Richie here today. But TD, first off, man, how you doing? Because I must say, as much crap that you have given me all season, I felt bad. I couldn't even troll you from what I witnessed during that. So let us know how you're feeling, like right after the loss, some overall takes. I know you've had a couple of days to sit on it. What's going through your head? I got to be honest with you, man. Um... You know, I'm going to have some a moment of transparency here. I'm a little embarrassed. Um, our franchise, <laughs> our franchise should be a little bit embarrassed. Uh, the Miami Dolphins, we now own the longest active um, playoff losing streak in all of professional sports. Um, that that's that that that's terrible man i mean i don't i don't think people understand the gravity of that situation with the lions winning now you know we own the longest streak um but i'm embarrassed more so because everything that could have went wrong went wrong from injuries being up 3 games with only 5 games remaining in the division and we find ourselves not only losing the division but getting bounced in the first round. Our team has some major reflections that we need to go through, a look in the mirror. And um, it hurts as a Dolphin fan. It actually really hurts. You know, I've been trying to tell myself I'm okay. I've been coping with it. I got my, my family at Disney World and, and it still hurts. I th thought I could run away from the pain, but it still hurts because this was supposed to be the year. Laugh, laugh, laugh. I get it, man. This was supposed to be the year. We have the weapons. We have the defense. We got the quarterback, quote, unquote. At least, at least we thought we did. Oh, my <laughs> gosh, man. I got to be honest with you. It's it's. It's a time of pain for Dolphin fans. I'll just put it like that. And I know we'll talk more about it, man. Yeah, man. I mean, I'll be honest. I certainly have, I mean, really not much to say. I mean, I feel like that it's the exact same theme of what Richie and I have been saying all season. Certainly a disappointment, but I think we all agree on who the main issue is. But before we segue into that, we got to give Richie the floor. Real fast. Talk to us <clears throat> about your thoughts after the Miami Dolphins ended up losing an absolute heartbreaker against the Kansas City Chiefs. Before I give my thoughts of the Miami Dolphins collapse, which I predicted, <laughs> please everybody do us a favor and shout out to BetUS TV for hosting this show. Gen Z Sports, guys, do not forget to hit that like button right now. Let's get to up to one. 100 likes, folks. We would greatly appreciate it if you guys can show the same love you showed to the AFC's roundtable right here to BetUS TV. They got a great vision, and Gen Z Sports has been a lot of fun to tune in. This is episode 26 of Gen Z Sports. So, folks, don't forget, hit that like button, subscribe to BetUS TV, and also don't forget to hit the notification bell so you're notified every single time BetUS TV goes live because you might be seeing us three a little more often here on the channel. We've been featured on Gen Z Sports throughout these past few weeks. We're excited to continue it. Now, getting into the Miami Dolphins, TD, I love you, man. You're my brother now. We've known each other for four years. But I just couldn't take that every single time I spoke about the Miami Dolphins, he would say, hater, hater, <laughs> hater. When everything I said came true, is that being a hater or being a realist? You know, you know what, Richie? Let me let me answer that. You were a realist, Richie. I want to apologize to you. I also want to apologize to Bills Mafia. Thank you. We were all three games with five games <laughs> left. How does this happen? Oh uh, no, TD. Now you're lucky that I I respect you because I'm not gonna pile on you because there's there, there's so much that you have to deal with 
with the stress of your own Miami Dolphins. So what am I going? What what are my words going to do to just make you feel worse about you and your Miami Dolphins team? So I'm not going to do that. But I just had to get that off because all I heard from you and Dolphins fans that I'm a hater. I'm like, guys, I'm trying to keep it real. I don't want to lie and say I think the Dolphins are going to win when I genuinely don't see them beating the Kansas City Chiefs. And the fact that they went out there and did the way that they did, performed the way that they performed, at least put up a fight. At least put up a fight, Miami. And that was my biggest gripe with them. They didn't put up a fight against Baltimore. They put up a fight against Buffalo, but weren't able to come out with the W. And they did not show up to Kansas City. And I am humbled to say that the Buffalo Bills are the best team in the AFC East. I was wrong about the Bills. I said it. TD, you remember, in August, I will admit it, I was wrong about the Bills. I predicted them to lose the division. And I actually predicted Miami Dolphins to win the division by midway through the season. I said, I said the Dolphins are going to win it. Without Aaron Rodgers and with the way the Bills are looking, I have the Dolphins winning this thing. But then, <laughs> when I saw a little reality come up with five weeks remaining in the season, I was like, the Bills actually have a path to win the division. I think they might. And they did it. And now the Bills are in the divisional round against the Chiefs, and I'm sure we'll break that all down. But TD, hold your head high because Tua Tagovailoa is about to get paid, and he's worthy of it. And we're going to break that all down right here on the show. And you know what? That is a tremendous segue. A beautiful, beautiful segue into the main topic. Obviously, we all wanted to hear. I feel like TD's just general thoughts of the game going into it. But really... This is something that I have been saying for quite some time. This is something that Richie has been saying for quite some time and something that even TD Finstock has been saying for quite some time on particular shows. But TD, I will tell you what, since the loss against Kansas City, on X right now, my friend, your fan base is just going at each other's throats about this Tua situation, right? Mm -hmm. Some people are saying, hey, man, we'll save some more money if we go on ahead and sign this guy for the next seven years, but then you'll be stuck with him for seven years. Sure, you save money now, but then you're stuck with him. You're starting this overall carousel. I feel like Tua has had so many opportunities, right, of showing you that he is the guy. Last year was, oh my God, he was injured. Just wait until he's healthy. All right, well, guess what? This year he was healthy. This year, all of his weapons. I know that you had a couple of injuries here and there. But at the same time, you have to put blame where blame is, and that is to us. So my question to you, we all know how you feel about it. Most of your opposition on Twitter knows exactly how you feel about it. But what the hell is going on with this contract? If you were Greer right now, what, do you, what are you doing? Because you are at the very least stuck with them next year because of that fifth-year option being exercised already. Talk to us. Well, we're not absolutely stuck with him because you can tr you can still trade a player and have the um, team that pick him up have to deal with the salary implications. But this is a tough situation in Miami, and I got to be honest with you, it's causing a somewhat of a civil war, an internal war between the fan base. Um, but I mean, it's no different. Tua has created a war within his fan base since the day he was drafted from the people who believed in him and the people who didn't believe in him. Um, unfortunately, and fortunately, I've been one of those individuals who didn't really feel like he would amount to be a um, franchise quarterback. And it wasn't just because of injuries, because I did my homework before we even drafted him. Now, here we are four years later, four seasons down, and Tua still has yet to prove that he is a franchise quarterback. We all understand that he's coming off two of his better seasons statistically, but when it matters most at the end of the day, in any fan base in football, there is one ultimate goal. Richie, do you know what that ultimate goal is? Hoisting a Lombardi. Dan, what is the ultimate goal? Winning the Super Bowl. Not just being competitive. Not just being relevant. It's about the Super Bowl, nothing more, nothing less. And there's a portion of the fan base that all they want is a Lombardi. And there's another portion of the fan base all they want is Tua. And unfortunately, the portion of the fan base that wants a Lombardi they're pushing back, and I'm leaving that charge because at the end of the day, we need a playmaker. We need a Lamar Jackson. We need a Josh Allen. We need a Jordan Love. Ooh. We need a – that's right. We need a C.J. Stroud. We need a Patrick Mahomes. We need guys like that who can make – Aaron Rodgers. 
We need a guy like that who can make <laughs> plays when the defense takes away what you do well. You can still put the team on their back, and they can carry you to bigger and better. Tua Tagovailoa cannot do that, and it is proven at this point. We know that he can sit in the pocket if he has a perfect situation, if the run game is good, if he has time to throw the ball and he has great weapons. But in the NFL, ideal situations are some of the rarest things that you will find. That's why when the Miami Dolphins faced a little bit of adversity with the injuries and um, just defenses figuring out what we've been doing, we, we couldn't do anything. There's nothing we could do. The Miami Dolphins need an elite quarterback, and I'm an individual who says keep swinging at the ball until you hit. Now, before I digress from this point, we're victims of, yeah, but this is the best we've had in a long time. You can't just let that walk. You know, there's nothing out there better. Do you think that Green Bay thought that there was something out there better when they moved on from Aaron Rodgers? Do you do you know when 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 the Chiefs um drafted Patrick Mahomes, did they just go into it saying he's one thousand percent going to be better than Alex? You have to keep swinging at the fences, regardless. These elite quarterbacks, you you don't know until you bring them in and try. You have to do what's best for the fan base. We cannot live through another Tannehill situation because we were just looking at Tannehill stats year three and four, just like Tua. Tannehill threw for over 4,000 yards. Tannehill had 27 touchdowns and only 12 interceptions, which was actually better. And he wasn't the guy. And he's way more limited. At least Tannehill was mobile back in the day and could take a hit. So... This is just bad news. Our franchise doesn't learn. We're hoping they get it right this time finally, but they but the consensus is they won't learn their lesson and above not learning their lesson, they'll think that they've learned their lesson by trying to get a team friendly deal. No, we want a new quarterback. We want to swing until we until we actually hit the ball. It's that simple. TD, can I just can I just say something really quick? Mm -hmm. This is a new TD. Okay, I'm not used to this. Like when, like you're oh, real. This, I mean, this all is, I heard all season what... was you justifying Tua's MVP. Like, did you believe in that when that was happening? Like, I'm, I'm feeling like you're actually speaking your own truth, and I respect that. It feels good. It's a breath of fresh air. Well, well I'm a fan. I'm a fan, Richie. And when you're you putting should. up, and when you're putting up the statistics, and you're winning, you want to defend everything on the roster. That's why Tua is the best quarterback in the division. He's the MVP. I knew who Tua was, but at the moment, playing the bad teams, we were getting W's, and he was putting up stats. And those stats were better than the actual elite quarterbacks. So I'm going to ride with it, and I'm going to ride for him. But at the end of the day, the season's over. We have a chance to get better. And when they make that big mistake and sign Tua on a long-term deal, I'm going to steal try my best to root for them at the end of the day. But I'm hoping they learn their lesson and do better. Isn't it there a path, though, TD? Like you look at Lamar Jackson, for example. They uh -huh. went into his fifth-year option without giving him a contract. Can't the Miami Dolphins go up to Tua and say, we have your fifth-year option, we're going to give you another year, and if he proves it, they have leverage of a franchise tag, whereas maybe they don't feel as comfortable giving him that long-term deal. Like, do you see a world – where they don't extend Tua, they don't trade for a new quarterback. Tua is the starter next year on the fifth-year option where this is it. This is your last opportunity to get paid, and that's exactly what the Baltimore Ravens did because and see, Lamar Jackson is Lamar Jackson. That's see, I'll what? hop in here real quick. The difference between that is, is that Lamar Jackson had an MVP under his belt. Thank you. He was going to get paid regardless. He was going to get paid regardless. They were just trying to hold out to figure out what that was. Exactly. That See, is the key difference going into it. And the thing to me is, is that but Pro Bowls. don't pay the guy. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's not even get into the Pro Bowl conversation, man. I've never seen anybody celebrate a golf longest drive competition and a dodgeball tournament, which has become the Pro Bowl now as like the ultimate honors going into it. It blows my mind. But listen. One of your colleagues, great content creator, it was El Capitan, he is huge on Jake Browning. I'm not saying Jake Browning is the mm -hmm. guy, but the fact that people are even pushing away the possibility of bringing in competition next year. Bring in competition, man. I mean, listen, dude, all of your star players are ticking clocks. 
right now. All right. And if you can just get a slight upgrade at quarterback, somebody that's mobile or somebody that maybe doesn't have an issue reading defenses in which that Tua has proven that that's what he struggles with, all you need is a slight improvement. And we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now about the Buffalo Bills taking over the AFC East and the Dolphins being Excellent. where they are right now. Zach Wilson's on the trade block, TD. Stop, Richie. Stop. Don't just stop. Stop. Uh, My God. Well, hey, you know what? (laughs) So we were discussing a lot right there about Lamar Jackson. And that just so happened to be um, a player that the Dolphins could have brought in. But it doesn't matter. So we can switch it off right now. And uh, Lamar Jackson, man, he is about to face the rookie phenom C.J. Stroud. We all know that 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 Lamar Jackson has this narrative floating around him right now that he is um, a choker, specifically in the playoffs by itself. Stats do not lie. He's not the same quarterback when it comes into the big game. C.J. Stroud has made a lot of people look dumb, and he absolutely wiped the floor with the Cleveland Browns this past week. So my question to the panel right now, boys, can C.J. Stroud shock the world and beat the Red Hot Ravens? Richie, talk to me, baby. Make Listen, me a- man, I picked the Houston Texans to beat the Browns where it felt like the whole world was picking the Browns. And speaking from a Jets fan, Jets fans know what I'm about to say here. We went up against the Texans and the Browns at the back end of the season. The funny thing is the Jets demolished C.J. Stroud and the Texans, and we got demolished by the Browns. But I still... And I was just using those two games as just an example of, you know, experience from a fan, just seeing the game every single snap, watching the film. But what I looked at from the Texans and the Browns was a big difference. C.J. Stroud is on another level of Joe Flacco. And now C.J. Stroud's got to go up against the first team All-Pro, former MVP, Lamar Jackson, who is well-rested. Woo! This is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. Now, the biggest difference I have uh, with this Ravens and Texans team you know, take the quarterbacks away. Lamar Jackson, C.J. Stroud, both top-tier talents. You look at the rosters and the coaching staff and the overall pedigree and the culture, the Baltimore Ravens check the box over the Houston Texans on everything. They've had hardball for over a decade. They have won a Super Bowl. They have a culture. They have a set standard. They have a championship pedigree. Whereas the Texans, they shouldn't even be here, which is a great story. They're fresh. They're brand new. They're all rookies. Ryan's included, their head coach, a rookie head coach, a rookie quarterback. They're young, and they don't really care about that. They're going in with this mindset on the road. Everybody picked the Browns. They went out there and blew them out. Everyone's picking the Ravens, and I feel like the Texans' mindset should be like, hey, what do we got to lose? Let's go out there and have some fun. Maybe C.J. Stroud can work some magic. But I find it really hard to believe to watch these Ravens lose this game. Um, Heading into the postseason, even before anything else, the seeding or anything, I had the Baltimore Ravens representing the AFC in the Super Bowl, and I'm going to stand on that. I haven't seen the Ravens play yet. I know there's a narrative that first seeds could be a little rusty, but I'm still going to um, you know, stick with the notion that I have the Baltimore Ravens not only winning this game but going to the Super Bowl. So I got the Ravens winning. That's not a knock on the Texans. I think that they're a phenomenal story. I think the AFC South is in good hands, and I think that C.J. Stroud is going to run that division for years to come. But when it comes to this, these two teams – Matched up with the quarterbacks, with the defense, with the offense, with the coaching, and you look at all the matchups, the Ravens check every box. But that's not to say the unexpected could easily happen. You never know. But I'm going to take Baltimore on this one. So what about you, TD? Uh, Well, guess what? Superstars shine, and Lamar Jackson is a superstar. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? C.J. Stroud is about to go on the road Mm. versus the Baltimore Ravens and get yet another playoff victory. Yes, I said it, and let me tell you why. First of all, let's not forget who Lamar Jackson is. We done seen MVP Lamar before. What has it amounted to in the postseason? At the end of the day, I can't bank on Lamar Jackson until he proves something in the postseason. This is where Lamar gets his knock. When has it, and for what reason do we have to just automatically crown the Baltimore Ravens because of Lamar Jackson's play this year? There's no different from the past. He's come up short in the big moment in the playoffs. But you know what? This kid, CJ Stroud, truth be told, some 
consider voting him the MVP this year over Lamar Jackson. We're talking about a rookie, 4,100 yards. We're talking about how, how many was it? 23 touchdowns with only five interceptions. Let that sink in, ladies and gentlemen, five interceptions. There are quarterbacks out here averaging one a game. This guy is averaging 0.33 a game. Like, it takes three games for him to give you one. And if that, I mean, let's call it what it is. And, and, and let's not forget, he had one game with three interceptions. That means he has 16 games with only two interceptions. That one game was an anomaly out of all of it. And even in that game, he threw for over 300 yards. They were slinging the rock, and he still has 73% completion percentage. C.J. Stroud is something different, ladies and gentlemen. Let's make sure we get that straight. The man's first playoff game, he has 76% completion percentage, almost 300 yards, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. He's not turning the ball over. He's taking care of the football. We know Lamar Jackson, they can fumble we know that Lamar could throw picks when things heat up the Texas defense is actually playing some solid football as well and I know that they're going to be at home in Baltimore and these sunny teams doesn't like it but I'm telling y'all now do not sleep on CJ Stroud in this game I got the Texans with the upset this kid is special he's going to be special for years to come Look out for him getting this victory, and he will officially be on the map as one of the most respected quarterbacks in the NFL rookie season. And so I'm going to tell you this, because me and you, TD, we are on the exact same page. All right, listen, I look at this, and I ended up putting like my take out on X, on TikTok, <laughs> you name it, and I have been getting eviscerated by Ravens flock community, okay? Ravens fans think that I'm an absolute hater. There is no way that a rookie quarterback on a team that got quote-unquote lucky into getting in the playoffs in the first place is going to beat their beloved Ravens. But let me tell you exactly what's going to happen. And this is just facts right now. Lamar Jackson has a single playoff win. He has yet to rise to the occasion. And even the wins, the one single win that he did have was not impressive, even to the slightest. The guy has not proven whatsoever that he can rise up to the call, rise up to the occasion. If he does, then please, I will be happy. I, I am a Lamar fan. I think that he is one of the greatest regular season quarterbacks of all time. Okay. I will put that crown on him now, but this is the big game right now. And I'm sorry, but when I look at a quarterback like CJ Stroud, who with my good friend, he just listed the entire reasons why this guy has an incredible TD to interception ratio compared to a quarterback that is literally middle of the pack in every single measurable ca category for a quarterback who is supposedly the unanimous MVP. If you're telling me that C.J. Stroud and the Houston Texans don't have a chance in hell, my friends, you are setting yourself up for disappointment or at the very least the highest blood pressure reading you have ever seen in your entire life. The Houston Texans, this defense has been absolutely cooking. This offense literally not only destroyed a good Cleveland Browns secondary, ladies and gentlemen, C.J. Stroud was playing with his food. This is a historically good secondary. One that was just shouted from the rooftops over in Cleveland by itself, and now you're getting a Baltimore Ravens team that hasn't played football in three weeks. They're star players. I don't want to hear that only three of their big names sat out during that. Those are the key pieces of your defense. And if you don't think that the Ravens are going to go out there and at least have, at minimum, one slow, rusty quarter... You're completely out of your mind. I have C.J. Stroud going out there and putting on a damn clinic. I definitely see the Ravens going blow for blow. But at the end of the day, man, I got to ride with the hot hand. I have been choosing against C.J. Stroud all season. It all started right pre-draft before he was drafted. And I will not make that mistake again. I will not make that mistake again. C.J. Stroud is going to upset Baltimore Ravens. Mm. In key bank. Um, and listen, let's not forget here. I know the hot hand is, and we have short-term memory with C.J. Stroud and the Texans. Let's not forget what the Ravens did this season 
Let's not forget the pure domination that they put on yeah, this, this season. 56 to 19 to the Miami Dolphins. Okay, it's the Dolphins. How about 33 to 19 against the form the other first seed across the conference against the San Francisco 49ers? Remember that? Super Bowl preview. It was the biggest game of the year on Christmas night, right? Everyone was super excited. The Baltimore Ravens went into San Francisco and dominated arguably the other best team in the NFL. The Ravens go up against Jacksonville, dominate 23-7. Dominate the Rams, 37-31. I can keep going here. Yeah. The Ravens, let's not forget who they are. I think we're all drunk off of the hype of C.J. Stroud, which we should be. And I think the Ravens having a bye is allowing all of us to forget who the Ravens are. And yes, it's a regular season. I got to prove in the big games. But I know that it's not the playoffs, but tell me that that Ravens 49ers game on Christmas Day wasn't a playoff vibe. Lamar showed up. And everyone that's like, oh, Lamar Jackson doesn't really have game, game-wrecking game numbers. It's not really that impressive. He doesn't need to because the Ravens are that good around him. Top-tier defense, elite run game. Lamar Jackson's a dual-threat quarterback. That's who he is. And I feel like a lot of people are forgetting that the Ravens are the first seed for a reason. 12-3. and three. So I just had to put it out there, put a little more respect on what the Ravens did here. I know they had to prove themselves in the postseason, but you talk about big games. They showed up in every single big game at the end of the season and uh, just had to give the Ravens some credit because I'm hearing a lot of crazy takes about them over here. Mm. Mm. See, Richie, here's the difference. We are not discounting what they did in the regular season. We're just taking into account what they do historically in the postseason. It's no different from the Cowboys. It's no different from teams like that. That's why you can come to expect it. So until the Ravens get over a hump, and this will be one, which the hump shouldn't be theirs. It should be Houston. But they've created this hump because of their postseason success. They need to get over it. Then then it's a whole different story. But until that, this rookie phenom is to be feared. C.J. Stroud is to be feared. He is to be respected with the utmost respect, and we're about to have a shootout because Baltimore's defense, they're going to give him that look that nobody's giving him all season. If he rises above this, man, I would call for all the writers, change (laughs) your ballot on the MVP, and you better give it to C.J. Stroud. I know it's supposed to be regular season, but if he rises above this and gets this W, uh, wh- wh- where's the argument? So that's the thing as well. And I mean, people right now in the chat, and by the way, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Smash that like button for us. Let's get to 500 I, likes. I, I'm seeing 598 of you watching and only 276 like buttons. Smash. That is absolutely criminal. Punch that like button. Let's go. This is bad. Come on now. And giving CJ Stroud a chance. And by the way, last thing we will say. And don't worry, guys. Listen, there's going to be plenty of coverage about this game by itself as the week goes on, especially on Gen Z Sports. But I'll tell you what, man. I've been seeing a lot of things in the chat, and everyone's flexing that Mark Andrews is coming back. I don't necessarily think that that's a good thing. Thank you. The Ravens' offense has been looking beautiful. And what do you think is going to happen if Mark Andrews does come back? And then, hey, you know what? Let's try and force feed this guy and include him back. That's going to mess you up a little bit, baby, because you know what? That momentum is a beautiful thing, including Mark Andrews back into your offensive game plan for the Baltimore Ravens. That's going to shoot themselves in the foot for at least one or two quarters. I can almost guarantee you that. Mm. And that's a beautiful know. thing. But guys, you know what? I'll tell you what, man. Listen, we, we got to talk about them Buffalo Bills. Oh. Them Buffalo damn Bills, man, fight night. (laughs) Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, there is so much surrounding this game right now, right? The biggest story, outside of the fact that, unfortunately, we probably ended up getting the worst possible officiant to officiate this game going into it. The Bills are 1-3 and against this guy for the past five years, and the Chiefs are 8-2, and and the Buffalo Bills are also riddled with absolute injuries, particularly in their secondary by itself going into it. So with all of those things being said, I'll start off with Richie because we all know what Richie's going to say. He's like, oh, Dan, it's the Chiefs. 
I'm going to ignore the fact that they're middle of the pack for scoring offense all year. I'm going to ignore the fact that their receivers can't catch a cold. I'm going to ignore the fact that Travis Kelsey, every single morsel of talent was sucked out of him by Taylor Swift. Richie, what is your take on this game, especially with all of these new things that have been stacking up, what appears to be against the Buffalo Bills' favor? Bills, Chiefs, does this negatively affect this game? Talk to me. Well, first and foremost, it's mind-boggling that this is Patrick Mahomes' first career road playoff game. Like, that just needs to be set because I do think that everybody's forgetting about the Chiefs and who they are and what their identity is with Mahomes. I just really do. And I know that the, you know, the narrative around them is the receivers, and I get all that. But the Kansas City Chiefs just proved, and yeah, I guess you could say because the Miami Dolphins are frauds. I mean, is that what we're doing here? <laughs> but the reality is they dominated the Dolphins. Absolutely. It wasn't like the Dolphins competed and it was a close game and the Chiefs didn't look that good. They went out there with the game plan and they absolutely dominated them on all three phases of the football. And now we got to see the Kansas City Chiefs go all the way to Buffalo. And I think that the Chiefs have this new kind of identity where they're not used to the whole world counting them out. And the Buffalo Bills have become this team that I feel like is that Cinderella story. It's the team that the NFL world wants to see win. Josh Allen's never been to the Super Bowl. This seems like it could be his year, which it very well could be, by the way. Um, the Buffalo Bills, I think this is their best chance to win the Super Bowl. And obviously it starts with this game because you got to get past the man and the team that you've been trying to get over for years and years and years. All I hear from Bills fans and Dan Mitchell, we're built to beat the Chiefs. We've been building this team to beat this team for years and years and years. Well, it took you Kadarius Tony offsides to beat him this year. Congratulations. So we shall see if that's going to continue this time in Buffalo. So last time I checked, it was 13 seconds two years ago. Probably the best NFL playoff game I've ever witnessed, right? The best playoff game, just blow for blow. And then the, they literally changed the overtime rules because of that game, because of Mr. Josh Allen, because he's the poster's child of the NFL now. And he deserves it. I mean, Josh Allen's a baller. This guy isn't even a quarterback. I don't know what to call him. I think he's the only QB in the NFL that should not even be called a quarterback because he's more than just a quarterback. He's more than just a dual threat. He is like an animal. Like He's a, a prototypical like robot. That I've never seen a quarterback do what he does. I mean, to the point where defenders are scared to hit him. Usually that was Big Ben, but Big Ben never ran through you for first downs. Big Ben would just be good behind the pocket, eluding the pressure and not going down. With sacks, Josh Allen could do that and then some. And, of course, you got to talk about the turnovers. But if you look at the numbers, Josh Allen's turnovers, not that much of an issue in the playoffs, right? His touchdown to interception ratio in the postseason is actually really good. Um, so this game is going to be the battle of a team on the road who knows what it takes to win these games. Patrick Mahomes has never not been to the AFC title game in his entire career. Five seasons being a starting quarterback, five seasons in the AFC title game in Kansas City with Andy Reid, which is why I just like to remind the people who these Chiefs are because I feel like some people like to hold on to narratives based on what the regular season is, but the regular season and the playoffs are com two completely different worlds, completely different worlds, which is why I'm not someone that's like, oh, but the receivers and this. I mean, Rasheed Rice looked pretty darn good. I mean, the Chiefs are a really good franchise that knows how to get the most out of not big name talent at their wide receiver spot at times. Not to say they're perfect. They have a lot of weaknesses around Patrick Mahomes for sure. But the one thing I've learned about Patrick Mahomes watching him is that he doesn't care about that. He will rise to the occasion. He is a quarterback that can overcome any situation. And the playoffs, Patrick Mahomes is clutch and he knows what it takes to win these types of games. Now, the big question is can he do it on the road? That's something that we've never seen from Patrick Mahomes. And I'm someone that likes to be safe with my picks because based off history, the Kansas City Chiefs will win this game. But that's not to say history can be rewritten and the Buffalo Bills can win this game. I think the Bills have a chance here. I think the Bills absolutely have a shot to go to the AFC title game.
but I'm going to stick with my guns and take Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs because even heading into this postseason, I said it's going to be Ravens-Chiefs in the AFC title game, and everyone's going to be upset. Oh, Mahomes again. We all thought that he sucked, but here he is all over again. He's going to be that annoying pest that's just like in everyone's faces. Everyone's sick of him. Similarly to the Patriots and Tom Brady, it's the same thing. Every year, oh, my God, the Patriots in the Super Bowl again. They're in the AFC title again. Kind of feels that same vibe. So that's why I'm taking the Chiefs because I just feel like they have more, you know, Super Bowl pedigree. They're the defending champions. They have two Super Bowl rings. They've been to the Super Bowl four times. Those are the, that's a team I trust more in this type of game than a, than a team in the Buffalo Bills who have 12 men on the field. who lost for 13 seconds. There's a lot of different things that the Buffalo Bills do to beat themselves. I haven't really seen the Chiefs do that. The reason why the Chiefs lose is a offsides penalty and drop balls. I think it go either way. You could say it's a coin flip, but I'm going to go with the champions and the Chiefs in this one to move on. I'm sorry, Dan Mitchell. I'm no, I'm never always right, so don't you worry. All right, TD. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say because I, I actually stole that take from you that the Buffalo Bills are built to beat the Kansas City Chiefs, right? <laughs> but now with everything that's on top of it, right, I mean, I would say when it comes down into the injury report, it sounds like Razul Douglas will be back. It sounds like Dotson will be back. Um, Taron Johnson, our slot being gone, he's kind of a hit or miss. He's going to be a key factor. But our offense is still at 100% for the most part, maybe outside of Gabe Davis. I think our offense operates a lot better without Gabe Davis in the picture. But with all of that being said, what are your thoughts on this game? Has your opinion shifted with all of this news? And what do you entirely expect for this Buffalo Bills and Kansas City Chiefs game? Yes, my opinion has shifted slightly, okay? Uh, my opinion before is that you were built to beat the Chiefs. Now you're built to demolish the Chiefs. You're not just going to beat the Chiefs. You're going to beat them bad in this one, okay? Um, I got to kick back on a few Kiss things Richie said. Um, Richie, I'm sorry. History does not tell us that you got to go with Mahomes in this game because Mahomes has never went on the road in history in, in, in a in a playoff division around. Um, yeah, you did, but that's why history does not tell us that you go with Mahomes in this situation. Mahomes, listen, the problems the Chiefs had in the regular season, going into wild card round, what did everyone say? You can expect their experience to clean all that up going into the playoffs. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, they embarrassed the Miami Dolphins, but they brought all their regular season issues with them in that game as well. There was no difference. The Chiefs played terrible outside of their defense, but their defense has played great all season, right? That's who's been carrying this team. But the Chiefs offense still did not play well. Patrick Mahomes overthrowing at least three touchdowns in the game. The team around, the receivers around Patrick Mahomes had a minimum, and this is because I don't know the exact number, but I know it couldn't have been less than eight drops in this game. You still can, you still can um, force him out of the pocket. The Chiefs' offense did not execute well at all, and this is why Miami, for the most part of the game, was like, we're still in it. Just make a play, offense. Just make a play. But we couldn't. And there were opportunities for us to make plays, but we missed Waddle deep for a touchdown. We missed Tyreek once. We got one with Tyreek on luck because it was so underthrown. He came back for it. But the Chiefs, there was nothing to be impressed about with the Chiefs. They are going up against the top three hot team in the NFL if not the hottest team in the Buffalo Bills. Now, I know the Buffalo Bills opponents haven't been all that great. Uh, you're lying to me. You got to go look at what Buffalo's been doing ever since Josh Podium got Josh Allen got on that podium and told the world, I'm just going to have to go back to being the old me. And I told everybody when that man said that it was over. This is why I hinted without saying, because it hurt me to say, but I've been hinting for five, six weeks now, the Bills, <laughs> they're about to win out. Did I, not, did, I, did I not say that, Dan? Did I not say that they were they were going to win out in the regular season? So did you say that we were going to win the Super Bowl? No. Now, I, see, now this is what I'm talking about. 
This is what I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen. You try to give them a little love, and then they get. The oh man, I'm about, oh dude, I'm gonna run. That's through. what I thought you meant too. No, I went six weeks ago when they were in trouble. I said they're gonna win out for the rest yeah. of the season, and I told Dolphin fans it concerns me because we gotta end the season like three and two or something like that, and we ended up one and four, and. Everybody, oh, we got this. Don't worry about it. We got this. I said, we should have it, but they're going to win out. So we better make sure we have it because they're going to win out. And sure enough, the Bills won out. And what's been the one consistent thing in your win out? Josh Allen being more aggressive, taking over the game, taking what they give him. Um, he still throws picks here and there, has his moments, but at the same token, he's been the elite version of himself. And I told you, as long as he's willing to sacrifice his body, it gives the defense's headaches. It's and the Chiefs aren't gonna be able to stop that headache. You can that secondary is gonna lock y'all receivers down. But as soon as you try to commit a man on Josh Allen, first of all, he's gonna beat him one on one, one on one running. Who like how many people do you really see tackling Josh Allen one on one? And even if you're good enough to do it, he's falling forward. Okay, so if, once you commit a man to him, now you're opening up passing lanes for him. And once you try to close those passing lanes, now you're allowing him to run. And don't get um, Cook involved as well. The Bills are going to demolish the Chiefs. The regular season issues will rear their ugly head in this game. On the okay. road for the Chiefs, might I add. Now, I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, TD, but you're so high in the Bills. Do you have them getting past one of the Ravens or Texans to go to the big game? Or do you have to see a little bit more before you? I gotta see this game. That. I gotta see this game. All I you're know really is, high in these bills. Bro. All I know, all I know is they not winning the Super Bowl. Okay, <laughs> long as they don't win the Super Bowl, life is all right with me. Okay. <laughs> hey, listen. I will tell you what, ladies and gentlemen. I was preparing a hype video or a hype speech for this segment, but I'll tell you what. The most unlikely person to give a hype speech just gave a hype speech for all Bills fans. Letting us all know, because listen, all of us are nervous about the injuries. I've said this joke before, but right now I look at our injury report. It's essentially a CVS receipt, right? And then now we have this one ref who we unfortunately don't have the best record against going into it. But here is my final message for any Bills fan that might have a couple extra layers of anxiety going into this game. Remember who we have. Remember who we have. Listen, one thing that Sean McDermott has been able to show is, is that regardless of who is in the interior of this defense, in the middle of the field, they do some of the best, best um, game preparation for creating inside leverage to force all of these passes outside of the numbers. Everyone is terrified right now that Taron Johnson being out is going to elevate Travis Kelsey's game to a whole new level with by the with how it stands by itself is, is that Travis Kelsey hasn't been the same Travis Kelsey this year. Sean McDermott is going to have a scheme by itself. I mean, stop pretending like you weren't surprised that A.J. Klein coming in for an injured Bernard last week and Klein comes out and starts making plays. It's the system that McDermott runs that elevates that middle linebacker position. I could list off several names that have been in this system and people always try and forget about the three or four game run that AJ Klein had a couple of years ago when Tremaine Edmonds was out. It's because of the system in and of itself. And we have a 100% healthy offense going into it right now. This game, it's written in the stars. As TD just mentioned, the flaws of the Kansas City Chiefs were on full display offensively. All right, but this Buffalo Bills team needs to go out there and punch them in the mouth. I don't want a back and forth, you know, shootout. I want an absolute demolition of the Kansas City Chiefs. I want to bury that 13-second meme six feet under, bury it, and never talk to it again. Because the Buffalo Bills haven't lost the game to the Kansas City Chiefs since 13 seconds, and I want to bury it. I want to bury it. And all we can do is sit back and wait as we continue to cover and predict exactly what might happen against the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs. And I'll tell you what, guys, listen, Bills fans, as many of you know, I am 
indeed convinced we're going to the Super Bowl. We're going to the Super Bowl, all right? But let me tell you what. Tickets are very expensive. Tickets are very, very expensive when it comes into the Super Bowl. So you know what? You might as well throw your hat in the ring for winning some Super Bowl tickets. That is absolutely correct. BetUS is giving away tickets to the big game, all right? And if you want to enter this contest, simply follow BetUS underscore official on X, all right? And you'll see myself and all of Bills Mafia in Vegas. I don't know why I said that I would be there. In my opinion, if the Buffalo Bills were to make it to the Super Bowl, I 1,010% would go there. I could care less even if I didn't have a ticket. I just want to be in the atmosphere. I just want to see all of the broken tables lined on the Vegas Strip with Bills Mafia stumbling all over the place. I feel like that would be my version of Disney World, TD. <laughs> well, let me let me add on top of that because I've never been to the Super Bowl and it's um definitely on my list. So um this is a pretty dope opportunity. Um whenever you do it, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go um to Bet US, but also make sure that you put your friend who you want to take with you. Make sure you tag him as well, all right? Um, this is a huge opportunity because it's the one thing I definitely want to go to. I just been waiting on my team to go. It looks like I'm just going to have to go. Uh, any Super Bowl will have to do for me, man. Well, and another thing for all those in the chat, over 600 people in the chat, hit that like button. And for all of you guys who are saying that Patrick Mahomes owns Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes is one in th one in three in the last four. He's one and three in the last four. I don't know where this narrative is, is coming from, but I understand that that one win was in the playoffs, and Josh Allen's going to have to correct that um, right here on this time. And so, it's like, and so it's not like Josh Allen threw on pads and served as a linebacker during that final drive in 13 seconds. That's why, like, I'm still – it still infuriates me when people attempt to convince me that wins or losses are a quarterback stat. All right. If J.A. was out there playing quarterback and he also took over as defensive coordinator, then sure. Tell me that Pat Mahomes owns Josh Allen. But as TD just said, he's one in three in the past four. So get that whole he owns Josh Allen out of this equation. It's all part of the great script that Dan Mitchell has been writing. The greatest oh, story oh, ever, ever told, told was starting to be written years ago that the Chiefs were like, yep, Buffalo, you can win this game. That doesn't really matter. You can win this game. That really doesn't really matter. Let's, let's see what game matters. And that's this Sunday. That is what it's all going to be. And Bill's Mafia, your biggest fear is the entire last few weeks, Dan Mitchell has been right on every single game. Every Man. single game. Greatest story ever told, we move on. Greatest story ever told, we move on. How bad would it be? Is if the greatest story ever told came to an end with Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs, the team that you're apparently trying to build to beat, comes into your house, your house, and ends your season, puts the dagger in your heart. Woo! You better not lose this game because your yeah, Super Bowl window is coming to an end if you don't yeah. win it this year. That would definitely be embarrassing. Great observation, Richie. To be honest with you, I know y'all are going to win this game, but I hope you don't. I really <laughs> hope you don't. <laughs> dude, dude, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, man. Misery loves company. I certainly uh, understand. Hey, I got your seat warm. I promise. Oh, my God. And, I mean, there's so much that we can still discuss on this. But, hey, you know what? There's a lot. Like, yes, the Bills losing would be embarrassing. But you know what else would be embarrassing? Very. One of these first seeds dropping their game all right now many like to covet the overall one seed as oh my god they got all the rest they're gonna play the lowest remaining seed but like this like the 49ers and the ravens all of their star players will not have played a snap of football in regulation for three weeks so my question to you guys is twofold is the first seed really an advantage and then number two if any first seed lays an egg, who is more likely to lose, if at all, the Ravens or the 49ers? If you had to pick one, talk to me, Richie. That's a great question. I mean, both teams are coming off crazy, crazy wins. 
right? right? I mean, the Packers, let's not forget what they just did. Now, yeah. it is against the Cowboys, who I guess you could say has been frauds in the playoffs for years and years and years and years. But the way that the Packers beat them was wild. And I know the narrative is, okay, um, first seeds, they're not playing for a while, but I don't know. They're, got, they're rested. They didn't have to stress out about Wild Card Weekend. They're all 110% fully healthy and ready to go. So I actually have both teams advancing. I have the 49ers and the Ravens both winning their games this weekend and moving on to the championship. I could be wrong, absolutely. I feel like this past Wild Card Weekend has us all second-guessing ourselves. Wait a second. The Packers just blew them out. The Texans just blew them out. And, of course, the Texans and the Packers have a chance here. But I'm going to stick with the two first seeds here because I think they both have a chance to not only make it to the championship game but to represent the NFL in the Super Bowl this year in Vegas. Mm. Um, first of all, let me say that I believe both teams, number one seeds, are going to go down, by the way. Um, yes. I, I know it, it sounds crazy, but I'm sorry. I'm riding hot hands right now. And I'm going to say the more likely right now is Purdy and company to go home. That's the most likely. Why? Because Jordan Love has been lighting it up better than C.J. Stroud. But we're talking about another guy who's getting his first real year of football, having the opportunity to sit behind Aaron Rodgers for three year, two years, three years, um, almost 4,200 yards. We're talking about a guy who literally put up 32 touchdowns, only 11 interceptions, almost a three to one ratio. I mean, in you look at his last nine games finishing the season, 21 touchdowns and one interception. Let me say that for the people in the back. Jordan Love in his last nine games, 21 touchdowns and one interception. When you're that's why they're in the playoffs because he start taking care of the ball, giving his chance his team a chance to win. You have quarterbacks in this league that's hurting their teams by throwing interceptions. You have quarterbacks in this league that are helping their teams by not turning the ball over. And in this league, what you need to be is a quarterback who isn't contributing to the losses. Because if you're not contributing to the losses, you're more likely contributing to the wins. I got Jordan Love being that um, upset for the most likely um, win over the first seed, most likely. But I think they're both going down. Wow. Both number one seeds going down is perhaps... It's not far-fetched. It's, it's not far-fetched. It's fetched. not. And, <laughs> and that's the scariest part because, because you want to know why. This is probably going to get me eviscerated already, but you know what? I'm willing to give the smoke right now. When it comes to the 49ers, I'll tell you what, boys. Brock Purdy is the worst quarterback that is left in the NFC playoff right now. I have to go with playoffs right now. Listen, and some people might call me nuts, but I would take Jared Goff over Brock Purdy. I would take Baker Mayfield over Brock Purdy. And I would take Jordan Love over Brock Purdy. Not because I think that they're astronomically better or they're in like an offense, but I think if you were to plug and play any of the remaining NFC quarterbacks into the 49ers, they would be even better. They would be even better going into it. Now, I'm going to have to disagree. I'm going to have to die on this hill that I do see the 49ers right now. And by the way, talk about embarrassment right now. The 49ers on paper have the easiest way to march to the Super Bowl. If the 49ers do not make it to the Super Bowl, they should be the most embarrassed fan base on the face of the planet because sure. all of the big names that you should be worried about have been taken care of. They've been taken care of. You have the Cowboys faltered, the Eagles faltered. And now you have a first-year starting quarterback with Jordan Love in Green Bay. You have Baker Mayfield, who everyone completely wrote off. And then you have a Jared Goff, who ended up, you know, I mean, he's good, but he's not elite by any stretch of the imagination. If the San Francisco 49ers do not make it to the Super Bowl soundly, that will be an utter failure going into it. They have no excuse, and I think 49ers fans have the most to lose 
if in fact they were to drop. I'm going to go on ahead and say that. Yeah. And I mean, I'm going to go on ahead and also say this. I do sincerely believe if any one seed falls, I certainly see the Ravens being the most likely candidate. Both. I'm not necessarily sure that I want to ride that train just yet, but I think it's the Ravens' time. Do you do you notice a trend in the NFL right now when you stack up the whole playoff picture, when you look at all 14 teams that were in, the game managers are getting clipped off one by one. Oh. And, wow. and the, the only game managers that have um, went to the next round is because they beat another game manager. The, the 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 quarterbacks who have more than just sitting in the pocket who are a little more mobile and things of that nature, they're advancing. Jordan Love escaping the pocket, throwing. C.J. Stroud escaping the pocket. We load Lamar still, still in there. Baker, if you see what he did, escaping the pocket. The way that – see, you can't just – in today's NFL, if you're going to be solely a pocket passer – you got to be perfect in doing it. And it's just not highly loppy. Um, it's not highly um, likely, excuse me. So there's only a few game managers left in my eyes. Purdy's one of them. Uh, golf maybe on the edge. You know, um, you know, these guys, I feel like they're going to, they may be some of the next guys out. Golf has a chance to go forward to the next round, though, but we'll see. But the game managers are clipping, getting clipped one by one. The playmakers are the ones who are advancing. That's what I'm noticing right now. Yeah, and, you bring and, up a and, great point. And people bring up Jalen Hurts. No, game, not even a game manager can survive that O-line. And, and, and that coach, okay? Uh, let's put it like that. Not even a game manager, which is part of the problem with Green Bay, too. Will they be able to survive LaFleur? Time will take. Especially when you look at the AFC, I think the one thing I've learned from a Jets fan's perspective of this wild card weekend is quarterback is king. It's not mm-hmm. groundbreaking news. It's not something that we're like, what? You need a quarterback to be good? Yeah, you do. You look at the four remaining quarterbacks. All four of those are the franchise, not backups, mm-hmm. right? Everyone's like, oh, there's a lot of injuries in the AFC quarterback world, which there have been, right? Joe Flacco stepped in for Watson. That was a cool story for a little bit. He got smacked down by a superior quarterback of C.J. Stroud. Lamar Jackson's the first seed, so he's already in there. And then, of course, the two powerhouses of Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. And, like, as a Jets fan, it's like, well, Aaron Rodgers is please stay healthy because I still believe Aaron Rodgers healthy is on that level being two years removed from back-to-back MVP. So just seeing where the NFL is right now in the postseason, you bring up a great point, TD, where the game managers are being snipped away and the really game-changing quarterbacks like Josh Allen, like Mahomes, like a C.J. Stroud, who was taken over the league by storm this year, no one really saw this coming, is kind of separating themselves. And we're like, this is how you win in this league. You need a star at quarterback. You can build around the team as much as you like and have the best coaching and have the best talent. That will only get you so far, but as it stands right now, quarterback is king, and the superior quarterback talent, especially in the AFC Conference, is in the next round for a reason. And then the next level of quarterbacks, you can say is on the other side of the conference, the NFC. Like you mentioned, Brock Purdy. I mean, this is where we really get to see who Brock Purdy is. Is he the game manager? Because he is a guy that has so much talent around him that's got him to this level as a quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Same thing as Jared Goff. Jordan Love's coming on of his own right now. And then, of course, the other guys over there. It's an interesting thing to say. So quarterback is king, and we shall see which quarterback will finish finish off hosting that Lombardi at the end. And just just to clarify real quick, Dan, I don't want to make people think that game changers, quarterbacks like that can't win or go to the Super Bowl. They can, but you also have to have the elements on the team that help them do it. Like Brock Brock Purdy, he can still go to the Super Bowl, but that run game is going to have to be top five. Those weapons catching the ball, they're going to have to play top five. That old line is going to have to remain top five. See, that's what you need when you have a game manager, everything around them. Because when things aren't going right, can they carry? And we saw Brock Purdy when McCaffrey and when Trent went out early in the season. He looked like one of the most average quarterbacks, if that, in the NFL. So 
That's all I'm saying. Game managers are good as long as the team can support them with structure around them, which isn't always realistic in the NFL. The only time it's typically realistic is when they're making peanuts. They're not making much money like Purdy isn't, like most game managers aren't. But as soon as they make the money, they can't afford it anymore. And then they have to deal with suffering. And it's time for people to just understand that's the formula. It's not rocket science. If you got a game manager, you better hope they're on a rookie deal and you can put everything around them. And after that, you're in trouble if you stick with them. That's why San Francisco is still in this position, because they were strong enough to move on from Jimmy G. What are we going to do? Get rid of Jimmy? He still went to the Super Bowl this and that. They said, yes, we are, and they are better for it today. If they would have kept Jimmy G with his salary, they wouldn't have some of the pieces they have on the roster today, and they may not be in the same situation. So this is the name of the game, ladies and gentlemen. You either get a playmaker, and, and you don't need everything, and you can give them money, or you get a game manager and keep rotating game managers if you want to be relevant. Anything outside of that, you are a loser, and the NFL has proven it at this point. And if you fail to acknowledge that, you're being delusional. It's that simple. Mm. Then you're muted. muted. Prop Mike. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you so much for tuning in to yet another edition of Gen Z Sports. I do have one last gripe for you. As of right now, we are peaking at 656 live viewers and only 426 like button smash, guys. Certainly do that because that assists the show into being pushed out into the YouTube algorithm where you can see a bunch of grown men yelling at each other for an hour, <laughs> Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. EST, about your favorite sports known to man. Follow BetUS TV on X, BetUS underscore official, BetUS TV, for all of these updates. Thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, we will see you tomorrow, same time. Peace. Peace.